Good evening and welcome to the Hank Center's 2014 Catholicism in Dialogue <coughs> series. My name is uh, Father Mark Bosco and I'm the director of the Hank Center. And this is uh, our first uh, event, so very, very excited to see all of you uh, here tonight. The Hank Center, if you don't know it, especially uh, perhaps if you're students, the Hank Center uh, for the Catholic Intellectual Heritage is now in its seventh year as one of Loyola University's centers of excellence. And with the generous financial support of obviously Joan and Bill Hank, Joan was an alumna of Loyola and uh, her husband Bill uh, on the board of trustees. Um, they have uh, endeavored to allow us or to uh, basically uh, fund us uh, to communicate and to research and to connect the rich intellectual and artistic heritage of the Roman Catholic tradition. So this series, Catholicism and Dialogue, is our own small way of promoting interreligious conversation at Loyola University. Each fall semester, a distinguished scholar is invited to come on campus for two days. First, to offer a lecture, such as tonight, that draws on his or her intellectual journey around issues of religious pluralism, interreligious dialogue, and comparative theological studies. We then invite them to meet with undergraduate and graduate students in seminar style on the next day to continue the conversation. Some of you, I think, who are here might be uh, with um, uh, Dr. Clooney tonight, uh, tomorrow, rather. It's a great privilege to welcome this year's guest, Father Francis Xavier Clooney of the Society of Jesus. Father Clooney joined the Harvard Divinity School in 2005 as its Parkman Professor of Divinity and Professor of Comparative Theology. He also serves as the director of Harvard's Center for the Study of World Religions. No stranger to the Windy City, though, Father Clooney earned his doctorate in South Asian Languages and Civilization at the University of Chicago in 1984. He then taught for 21 years at Boston College before that long voyage across the St. Charles River to Harvard, Cambridge, Massachusetts. <laughs> Father Clooney's primary areas of scholarship concern theological commentarial writings in the Sanskrit and Tamil traditions of Hindu India and the developing field of comparative theology, a discipline distinguished by attentiveness to the dynamics of theological learning deepened through the study of traditions other than one's own. His numerous articles and books illustrate this trajectory including his most recent monograph from Stanford University Press in 2013 called His Hiding Place is Darkness, a Hindu Catholic Theopoetics of Divine Absence. In this work, Clooney explores and compares this theological trope of divine absence in both the biblical Song of Songs and a Hindu text called Holy Word of Mouth. And finally, I might add, one can keep up with what Father Clooney is thinking, as I often do, by reading his regular blog, In All Things, sponsored by America Magazine. There you can find his personal and uh, insightful reflections on some of today's news and events. Tonight's program begins with Father Clooney's talk, Hinduism and Catholicism, Seeking God in All Things. It will be followed by responses by two faculty from Loyola's theology department, Drs. Hugh Nicholson and Tracy Pinchman, thank you for joining us. Their work in various ways parallels or builds on Father Clooney's. Finally, we have asked two of our student leaders here at Loyola, Shio Shukla of the Hindu Student Organization and Zachary Davis, a Catholic Studies minor student, to offer a brief comment on their sense of how their own religious understanding and spirituality has been deepened and or celebrated while studying at Loyola University. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Father Clooney to the lectern to begin our evening. Good evening. I'd like to express my thanks and to Mark uh, Bosco for inviting me to be here tonight, uh, to Brett Lewis for showing me hospitality when I arrived on campus about an hour ago, um, and to, um, even before they say a word, to my respondents, I look forward to hearing from them. I had asked already and was turned down my request that I wanted to like face out this way and look at the beautiful lake <laughs> while speaking, but they thought it would be bad for the video. So I just asked that you not look at the lake while I'm speaking. And just, <laughs> just look at me, that's all. So the, the topic we have tonight, and I'll open it up in my 45 minutes, and then we'll have our, our responses and discussion, is, is the famous well-known, and I think uh, you can hardly need any explanation, seeing God in all things, finding God in all things. I mean, it's one of the basic insights and charismatic gifts of 
Jesuit spirituality back to the beginning of the order. And it has inspired Jesuits everywhere in the world, um, right from the foundation of the society, Ignatius Loyola, uh, the founding of schools, the teaching across Europe, and then the great, great spread of the Jesuit order around the world. Uh, this great sense that God is everywhere, that our possibility is to seek, to find, to see God in all things. And this inspiring message goes back to the beginning of the society. Um, everyone knows that in the, in the very foundi foundational document of the order, the constitutions that kind of set up the order, St. Ignatius says, that those who are in formation, the young Jesuits as they begin, should be exhorted to seek God our Lord in all things, distancing from themselves love from all creatures to the extent that this is possible in order to place it in their creator, loving him in them all and them all in him in conformity with his most holy and divine will. So everything in God, God in everything, focusing on God where God can be found. Uh, Father Avery Dulles, a great theologian who was later a, a cardinal of the Catholic Church, uh, points back even earlier to the exercises, the spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. In the first principle and foundation at the opening of the exercises, Ignatius teaches that sickness and health, poverty and riches, honor and dishonor, a short life and a long life can all serve as a means to that union with God that makes up our eternal salvation. In the examination of conscience, in the middle of the exercises, Father Dulles goes on to say, Ignatius writes that those advanced in the spiritual life can constantly contemplate God, our Lord, in every creature, in his essence, in his power, and in his presence. In the contemplation to obtain divine love, that beautiful meditation at the end of the exercises, Ignatius says, reflects on how God dwells in all creatures, especially in human beings, but also in every living being. In everything, God can be seen and found. And as Father Dulles points out, this vision kind of radiates through even the letters, the mundane documents, all that Ignatius did in his ministry. And this became a, a guiding force for the society in its early years. Uh, for instance, Father Geronimo, or Jerome Nadal, uh, for some time a secretary to Ignatius, helping him found the society, but also a superior in different places, said that in, in, in essence, and this would be already in the 16th century, that this was a distinctive charism of the society, to see, to seek, to find God in all things. Nadal described Ignatius' insight as an appeal to see and contemplate in all things, in all actions, in all conversations, the presence of God, the love of spiritual things, to remain a contemplative even in the midst of action. And this for Ignatius according to Nell, was always closely connected. You see God in all things, and then in everything you do, you're acting in God's presence. God is with you, you are in God, God is in you in all that you do. Nadal believed that this being a contemplative in action, because one can find God in all things, this was the grace and charism of the society. Now this plays out in many ways over Jesuit history, right up to the present time, of course. But I think of famous figures in, in the uh, history of the society. For instance, the 19th century poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. I'm sure you've met, many of you have read Hopkins' poetry. In his famous and lovely poem, As Kingfishers Catch Fire, he has a famous phrase which echoes, I think, with so many of us. Christ, for Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father through the features of men's faces. And the sense that in every woman's face, every man's face, every face that we meet, there's somehow a radiance of God's presence and that everything is alive with the presence of Christ. Or in the 20th century, the great uh, Jesuit scientist uh, mystic, Teilhard de Chardin, in the midst of doing his work that would lead to this vision of the universe converging in Christ as the Omega Point, says at the beginning of his famous little book, The Divine Milieu, about 40, 50 years ago, that his goal in writing this book was to teach how to see God everywhere, to see God in all that is most hidden, most solid, and most ultimate in the world. Without any mixture, without any confusion, the true God will, under your gaze, invade the universe, the universe as we experience it today. And while Teilhard de Chardin was certainly an extraordinary figure 
reaching out with this vision even into the realms of science that we're developing in this time, the instinct was the same. Wherever your knowledge can go, wherever your heart can go, Christ will be there. Now this has been spelled out you know, very technically in all kinds of writing, and I won't dwell too much on the technicalities, but just to give you two examples. Um, in the 1970s, uh, Father Joseph Stayerly uh, wrote a famous essay called Ignatian Prayer, Seeking God in All Things. And he stated the basic principle, the inner indissoluble connection in the case of Ignatius between Trinitary and mystical prayer and the formula finding God in all things is based in his unique mystical picture of God. For the same triune God that he met in grace and prayer and constantly in all his work is the same God who is the creator, the maker of the universe, the Lord of history. The same Lord. Sterile goes on. It's a very wonderful article. He develops this, and he, he gives like a number of headings under which he develops, and I won't go through it, but I'll just give you the headings. Uh, that when we think more clearly about finding, seeing, seeking God in all things, it pertains to regarding creation from the viewpoint of faith. You see the world as it is around you through the eyes of faith. In everything you are and everything you do, a continual search for the divine will. Purity of intention, as Ignatius said, I quoted earlier, you kind of close everything out, you find God, and then you're given everything back. And then finally, pure love that serves. For Ignatius, for Nadal, and I think for many in the tradition over the years, this vision that God is everywhere means that you can serve God everywhere. That wherever there is a human need, somebody crying out for help, a possibility to teach, to heal, to make peace, God is there. So it reaches out in many different ways. The famous Jesuit theologian, perhaps the leading Catholic theologian of the 20th century, Karl Rahner, um, he took up this point, and as Philip Endian, a scholar at, um, I think now in Paris, but had been at Heathrop College in London and visited this country many times, he goes deep into how Rahner sees that what we learn by saying that God is in all things tells us something about who God is. It's not simply this is easy for us, but it's a vision of what God is like. And I'll quote a little bit from Endine's taking of Rahner here. Um, if creatures can find God in all things, then the structure of human knowing and willing must be reflected in the ontology of the Godhead. Or to put it less technically in my own words, that we can seek and find God in all things tells us something basic about what God is like. God is no stranger to us because God is everywhere in our world and God does not hesitate to be in our world. Or as Endian continues, from this vision flows a radical human, Christian humanism. For if a person acts following God's inclination and descent into the finite, they will no longer be a person whose in, innermost torment and desire is to lay bare the relativity and meaninglessness of everything and anything. They will no longer be somebody who idolizes or makes nothing of finite reality, but rather it's a way of embracing the world. And therefore you can have a university as a manifestation of love of God and, and the seeing of God in all things. For the love of God, which seems to let the world sink away, is a love for the world. It loves the world with God. Thus, in fact, it is what enables the world to rise eternally. And as Rahner goes on in Endy, and I won't quote this part, it also then again turns into service that who you are, how you see God, what you know God to be, sends you out on mission. Because there is nowhere in the world where the will of God is not being enacted, and we become the vehicle of that acting. Now, all of this, I think, is well known, and I think many things I've just said um, are familiar to you, and I need not belabor them any further. But I think starting in the 20th century, although one can trace it back to the Jesuit missionaries, Robert de Nobili, Matteo Ricci, Jesuits who went everywhere in the world and encountered other religions over the centuries. But I think in the 20th century, particularly with the coming of Vatican II, particularly with the document Nostra Aetate, there was kind of a harmonious coming together that finding God in all things, in all persons, in all possibilities was also an opening to an embrace of God in all religions. 
I mean, the famous document Nostra Aetate was not written for or by Jesuits, but nonetheless the spirit of the most famous passage perhaps is clear, namely that the church, to quote, regards with sincere reverence those ways of conduct and of life, those precepts and teachings which, though differing in many aspects from the ones she holds and sets forth, nonetheless by no means rarely reflect the radiance of the truth that enlights all people. And after centuries of kind of being afraid of other religions and turning away from them or pulling back from them or feeling we have to set boundaries, this remarkable statement by the bishop, bishops at Vatican II was that whatever is good, whatever is holy, even if it's not the same as what the Catholic Church says, we embrace. Why? Because the light of Christ is shining out of it. Another way of saying that the light of the God we see everywhere comes out in different religions. Now, all of this is quite beautiful. And all of this, I think, inspires us. And all of it inspires a lecture series like this and the great hope we have on a Jesuit Catholic campus that God is everywhere in our midst. But I do think we have to be a little bit careful, too, particularly when a Jesuit is speaking, about how remarkable we are and how wonderful our insights are. <laughs> For if we are convinced that we will find God, God is already known to us from the Bible in other people's religions, we should be aware that this expectation, particularly if announced as an auspicious aspect of how we are to be hosts and how they are to be guests, might, well, might come across as well-intended, but nevertheless a kind of condescension. Like we welcome you here if you're not Catholic or Christian because we see God in your religion. Welcome, come aboard. And this is, is a, you know, it's a wonderful insight. It's open and generous. But it's sort of saying, I know something good about you. You can come in. Or to put it another way, um, finding in other people's faith what they themselves may not see there. You never knew that Christ was deep within you. You never knew that Christ radiated out of your face. Oh, and you find out from the Jesuits that this is the case. So it might seem like a kind of uh, Christian know-it-all attitude, even with the best of intentions, that everything that happens to everyone on the campus confirms our view. There's nothing you can do, nothing you can say that doesn't in some way affirm Christian, Catholic, Jesuit views of the world. And that, I think, is a brilliant insight in some ways, but it also has to be looked at with caution because it can be so self-congratulatory. And while I think it's not part of, it's not an option, it's not part of our tradition to pull back and say, okay, we don't see God everywhere, or you can't see God in all things, or God is not everywhere. No, we have to keep somehow a sense of our vision. My suggestion, and this will get me into the heart of my presentation, is really that we have to go further. Not that God is nowhere or God can't be seen anywhere, but also not simply that this is a Christian, Catholic, Jesuit gift to see God everywhere, but mainly to premise that I'm sure in each and every religious tradition represented in this room, there's a way of, of recognizing the holy, the sacred, the presence of the divine in other people's religions as well. And I think this is a point we need to look at, that it's a mutual seeing. The possibility that I see God in you, and according to your background, your tradition, your family, your culture, your religion, you may see God in me. The names may be different. The power of the images may be different. But I think the deeper level of this interreligious learning with this vision of God everywhere is to say it's a two-way street. I see God in you, you see God in me. What I'd like to do in the, the central section of my paper, and this will be new for most people in the room, I think, so it's a little bit more heavy duty, is to give an example from my work in Hinduism. Namely, in another religious tradition, how does it come about that in that tradition there's an instinct toward seeing God everywhere, seeing God in all things. And this is just one example from one South Indian Hindu tradition, the Sri Vaishnava tradition of South India. And all it can prove, because we have only a short period of time, is that the door can be opened, and that simply through things that I've read over the years, I can see a good example of how God is found everywhere in another religious tradition. And as I'm talking about Sri Vaishnava South Indian Hindus, uh, their writings and poetry over the past 1,500 years, in Sanskrit language, Tamil language, be thinking of other traditions, Buddhist or Muslim, Jewish, 
or any of the faiths that may be represented in this room, are there resources and traditions you're familiar with that kind of open the door to this kind of learning back and forth? So I go to South India, deep South India, the Sri Vaishnava tradition, which is called that because Vishnu is the supreme deity, and his eternal equal consort is the goddess Lakshmi. So Sri, Lakshmi, Vishnu, Narayana, who are more famously known sometimes in the avatar forms of Krishna, Krishna and Radha, uh, Rama and Sita, in other forms, a great sense in this very rich literary poetic culture that God can be seen everywhere. And the example I'll give you is this. In the ninth century, there was a poet called Shatakopan, uh, one of the most beloved of the Tamil saints of South India. And in his 1,100 uh, songs of 11 verses each, therefore in his 1,100 verses of poetry from the ninth century, there's a beautiful song about a third of the way through. And I'll just read you the first two verses. And they're about he, namely Narayana, the Lord. He is also the red lotus-eyed Krishna. He ate the seven worlds. See him now. He is earth, sky, humans, divinity, and everything else. He puts forth radiant, encompassing knowledge. He created all creatures, and yet, too, he is one with the most lustrous light. He is the original form of the three deities. Footnote on that, we know, if you know anything about Hinduism, you know there's Brahma, Vishnu, and Shiva. He is saying in his poetry that deeper than that manifestation of the three is the one, who is Vishnu Narayana. And he is beautiful, he is Krishna, he is the Lord, he is in all things. The second verse, he is the original form of those deities, he is their beginning and their source. He is their end, he saves them. He rests on the wide ocean, he is the God of gods. He bears the victorious bow that set Lanka on fire. He destroys sin, his eyes are wide lotuses, praise him. Now, if we had lots of time, we could simply go through those verses. I could hand them out to you, and we could pretend we're in class and talk about them. But what I'm interested for our purposes tonight really focusing is one particular angle that comes up when the commentators on the poetry, so reading his poetry as sacred scripture, three or four hundred years later in the 12th century, 13th century, 14th century, go to these verses and pick out something quite interesting and unusual. These verses, you can tell from the first two that I read, but it goes on for ten verses, are really an, a, a kind of a positive invitation. So, you know, see him, come to him, appreciate his beauty, know who he is. And all the commentators in those first centuries after the poet remark on the fact this song is so different from the one before it. And while I won't have time to go into the one before it, the previous song is a scolding song. Like you people, you are foolish. You are caught up in the world. You don't have the right values. You lose yourself in pleasures. You know everything except the one God you should know. And they're saying, well, what kind of mood could he be in, the poet, that in one song he would be scolding and kind of irritated and annoyed at people, and then suddenly, without any real transition, the next song, he's, in, he's saying, come and see, it's so beautiful. Everybody can see this. What's going on in his mind? And while the commentators um, explain it in various ways, uh, the, the clearest explanation given by the great commentator Nam Pillai in the 13th century, he says, well, this reminds me of the other scriptural passage. It reminds me of when Sita was captive on Sri Lanka. And if you know anything about Hinduism, you may have read the Ramayana or some version of that story with the great Prince Rama through family intrigue, is exiled into the forest for 14 years. And his wife Sita goes with him, and his brother Lakshmana goes with him. And they're dwelling in the forest during this exile. And then partway through the exile, she's kidnapped by Ravana, the king of Sri Lanka. And she's taken off to Sri Lanka. She's held kind of in a garden. And every day he comes and kind of says, look, forget about Rama. He's not coming for you. He's not going to save you. Marry me, and you'll be my queen. And he won't touch her, but he keeps coming every day and saying, listen, you've got to give in. You've got to consent to be my wife because your husband has failed. He has not protected you. 
And the commentators then say, well, how did Sita respond to these entreaties from Ravana, who kidnapped her and is holding there against her will? And he says, well, just like the poet in the verses I read, on the one hand is very appealing, very open, saying, go to the Lord and see the Lord, having just rebuked the people saying, you're not paying attention, you're not listening, you're not doing the right thing. So too, when Sita talks to Ravana, on the one moment she's scolding him and saying, you fool, you've just ruined your life, Rama will come and kill you, your kingdom is over, Lanka will be burnt to the ground, you have no hope. And then say, but Ravana, it's not too late. If you go to the Lord, if you go to Rama and put yourself at his feet, he will forgive you, he'll restore you to your throne because he never forgives anyone who comes to him, him with good intentions. And you say, it's just like that, where on the one hand, rebuke, criticism, scolding, and then suddenly the next moment, praise him, love him, see him, and he will care for you. Now you may be wondering, what does this have to do with the theme of seeing God in all things? The commentators, and it's very much like reading any traditional uh, form of commentary, they're always thinking of other texts when they talk about any text. Because in one point, and he quotes this, this Nampilai, when Sita is speaking to Ravana, she says this, If you desire to retain your station, your throne, your kingdom, and if you wish to avoid a terrible death, it would be very appropriate for you now to make a friend of Rama here, this bull among men. To make a friend, to make peace with Rama here, this bull among men. And for the commentators, suddenly it comes alive. How can she possibly say Rama here, this bull among men, when Rama is some thousands of miles away in India, wandering around in the forest, looking for Sita? And this is the question then they take up on, why does she say this Rama here, instead of that Rama there? I am absent, he is away, but this Rama here. And goes on then, Nampillai and all the commentators, to start reflecting on how can she say in the absence that the Lord is with her. And they quote, um, I think it's about six verses from other texts that make the point clear. And I'll, I'll go through them very briefly because our, our time is limited. But passages in which Sita, even when she's alone on Sri Lanka, even when she's in captivity, even when she doesn't know where Rama is, she has so filled her mind with love of him and is so confident that he will come that he seems extremely present right here and right now. He's not simply somewhere else, but wherever she is, he is. She sees him in that garden. One passage they quote is this. Uh, the beauty of, um, uh, I'm sorry, uh, the background is uh, Hanuman, the great monkey king, comes to Sri Lanka to see her in the garden. And at first he's dismayed, saying, oh, look, she's shabby looking, she's not eating, she's refusing to change her clothes, she's refusing to wash or anything, because she's basically boycotting, saying, Ravana, I'll take nothing from you. And then suddenly she's transformed before Hanuman's eyes, and she's beautiful, and she's radiant, and she's in gems and garlands and everything. And she, he's wondering what's happened. She looked like she was disheveled, and now she's beautiful. And he realizes this, the beauty the real beauty of this black-eyed lady and the perfection of her every limb are just like Rama's. She clearly belongs with him and to him. Her thoughts are firmly fixed on him and his on her. It is for this reason that she and that righteous man survive even in their moment of separation. So because she's so fixed on him, the external experience of being disheveled and a captive is transformed into all the beauty that would be there when he's physically present, because in her intense longing and learning and loving, he's really with her, and her beauty comes forth. Uh, he then goes on to quote a poet from around the same time as Shadakopan, so from two or three hundred years earlier. I will take you, the poet says to the Lord, and I will place you on my tongue without erring. I will speak the true word that you have tested. I place you in me, and myself in you. And so, my Father, rule me, be protector of my soul. And the commentator says this catches the same intensity. 
I place you in me and myself in you. And the reason that Sita can say this Rama here, even though the story says he's far away, is because she has placed Rama in herself, her husband, and Rama, who is having the same experience off in the forest, is placing Sita in himself. And so for both of them, they say Rama here, Sita here. And they live with this vivid sense that where they are, the beloved is. Now this is not the same as saying finding God in all things according to the Ignatius tradition, but it has something of the same power and vision to it that where you are, if you love, if you imagine deeply enough, that is where the Lord is to be found. Another passage they quote, Sita does not even notice the demons around her. She sees nothing of the garden, the trees, their fruits and blossoms, for her heart is fixed on just one thing, and the only thing she can see is Rama. And it seems to be saying that her mystical vision in the garden, everything she sees is, is Rama around her. Almost as if Ignatius is saying, see God in every person, see God in every place, see God in everything. Sita has this intensity of love that everything in the garden, even the demons who are her captors, she sees God in all of them. Or another passage, um, no, the final passage is, is quite different um, because according to the commentators, love is one way to have this intensity of the inevitable presence of the Lord wherever you are, but fear is too. And so Ravana, the king, who's beginning to realize that Sita may be right, that his doom is coming because he's done the wrong thing and a dangerous thing by taking Sita, says this, I remember Raghava, Rama's arrows, that like the staff of Brahma, the creator God, blazed with brilliance of lightning, the lord of the demons shuddered. He could not get this out of his mind, that day and night he sees the arrows of Rama coming at him as if they're coming right now. And so while he thinks in his rational mind that Rama is actually thousands of miles away, still looking for Sri Lanka, the intensity of his realization of what he has done makes it seem, just as Sita saying, my beloved right here with me. Ravana is saying, his arrow is coming at me right now. And so this vivid presence. And one of his assistants, the demon Maricha, one of his captains, um, says similarly, behind every tree, in every tree, in every tree, I seem to see Rama cloud, clad in his bark clothes and his hides that he's been wearing in the forest, wielding his bow like death himself with noose in hand. Everything he looks at, suddenly Rama is coming at him. And while we may not see this as the most positive form of seeing God in all things, because he's being frightened to death over and over again, nonetheless the intensity of his preoccupation with Rama suddenly says, everywhere I look is Rama. And he goes on to say, or rather indeed thousands of Ramas do I see in my fear. The entire wilderness, Ravana, is nothing but Rama to me. Which is a beautiful insight, even though it's in fear and he's in dread of being killed, as he will be later in the battle, that there's nothing but Rama, there's nothing but God. And I think Ignatius would recognize that this is something like what he is saying. It is Rama I see even when no one is near. I see him in my dreams, I see him when I wake up, I see him when I am half out of my mind. I am so terrified of Rama that every word beginning with the letter R, riches or roads, for instance, every word beginning with R frightens me to death. Rama is everywhere. I could go on with this, and there are technical things about how this state comes about. I refer to it already with Sita as, again, as the intensity of love and longing. And again, I think Ignatius would recognize this. If you love deeply enough, intensely enough, then God will be where you are. But they also have, in medieval Hinduism, a meditative practice that any of you who do yogic practice uh, with some kind of visualization stream to it would be that you can cultivate this state and you focus and focus and focus and you conjure in your mind the, the presence of the one you want to see. Uh, could be Christ. Could be a, a, a broader image of God. It could be a goddess. Uh, could be whatever is appropriate to your own practice or religious tradition. But the intensity of seeing it makes it seem real and in your presence. 
and in a number of the passages where they talk about this externalization of the form, it goes from being a mental state, like you close your eyes and think about it, to seeing this vivid presence before you, and you reach out to touch it. And that this state of somehow conjuring the one you love in front of you becomes a meditative practice by which every direction you look, you see that one. And it's so vivid and so real, you think you can reach out and touch. So there's a lot of layers of meaning, and we could go back um, and think about this in terms of the spiritual exercises. How is it that you contemplate the presence of God or see God in the exercises of Ignatius, really in the Sri Vaishnava tradition, which again is just one of many examples, again and again you intensely visualize until the one you love is standing before you and you begin to exchange. I could go on with this example, but I think you get the point that this single example based on one verse from one Hindu tradition in South India opens the doors to saying, well, in that tradition too, there are the spiritual grounds, the grounds in, in practice for saying that God is not simply there or there or there, but God is everywhere around. And it could be through, again, the, the passion, the love of a Sita who sees Rama everywhere, or Rama in his longing for Sita who sees Sita everywhere, but even through these negative emotions, fear, dread, realizing that the Lord is everywhere. And what's interesting about this in part is that it's not the same as Ignatian spirituality. It's not the same thing. But there could be a kind of a meeting point in saying from very different starting points with very different understandings of reality and what the Lord is like, suddenly we realize we're both seeing God everywhere and in all things. And I think that is a very interesting step to take. I'd like to mention four things that I'm not going to talk about because I, I want to um, finish fairly quickly. One is that with like any kind of comparative study, if you do any kind of comparative work, anything you say raises more questions than you've answered. And you could even see, I hope, from this glimpse, touching on the well-known Ignatian tradition and this presumably for most people unfamiliar South Indian Hindu case, you can say, no, wait a minute, what about that difference, that difference, explain this, how can you say Ignatius said that, and Numpillai said that, and so on. So lots of differences come to the fore, but luckily, because our time is limited, I don't have to take up those difficulties. I'll just leave those aside. Uh, the second is, just as I could read Karl Rahner, and say, well, Rahner is saying, if we can see God in all things, that tells us something about what God is like. You can do that in heavy-duty Hindu theology as well. So the great Hindu theologian, uh, who inspires many of these commentators, Ramanuja. Some of you may know that name, Ramanuja. He has a, a very complex Vedanta theology in which he ba basically says that the, the ultimate depth of every reality is God and the ultimate meaning of every word is the name of the Lord. And he has kind of a whole metaphysics and ontology of the universe such that every form, every name ultimately point to God. And while that's a kind of theological development that's not the same as the poetic or dramatic telling of the story, it's, and it's not the same as what Karl Rahner would say, there's a great kind of two great theologians could talk to one another. And you could say, well, that's similar to that. They're both struggling with the nature of reality. A third point would be to talk about, having talked about this visualization practice where they intensely in a yogic meditation conjure the presence of the Lord, we could go back to Ignatius and back to the Jesuit tradition. And again, the great uh, Father Nadal in the generation, Ignatius's generation, and then after Ignatius, um, publishes a book in his lifetime, kind of Meditations on the Gospels. And his Meditations on the Gospels, he um, includes in the book, using technology of the time, um, images. So images from the life of Christ, ranging from the Annunciation and Nativity all the way to the ascension when Jesus is taken up to heaven, and then develops in his prose a whole kind of language of intense visualization. You learn to see the Lord. What Ignatius wants you to do in the exercises is to see. And that seeing is not simply taking a look, but you have to practice and practice and purify your vision until you learn to be the kind of person who when other people say, I just see trees, I just see the lake, I just see things around me, to be the kind of person who can say, I actually see God everywhere and therefore can serve God everywhere. That there's a whole kind of Ignatian practice that Nadal, and I can give you the reference afterward if anyone wants to follow up on it, 
um, explains this and says, um, Ignatius wanted you to learn to meditate this way where your inner eyes are open. And again, I think that would make sense in terms of the Hindu commentators I was quoting from. Yes, we believe also intense meditation visualization will open the door back and forth between the two. But I'll stop. I won't say any more about that either because time is short. And finally, the last thing I'd say of the things I'm not going to talk about um, is where does this lead? And I mentioned earlier that for... Uh, in the Ignatian tradition, right back to Ignatius, but certainly for Karl Rahner and modern thinkers, the point of this seeing God in all things, seeking God in all things, finding God in all things, is service. It's not simply a mystical vision that's worthwhile in itself, but it's that you can then go out in the world and wherever you are, you see and serve the Lord. Is the Hindu tradition that I quoted, the Sri Vaishnava tradition, doing the same thing or not? On one level, definitely not. Uh, the Sri Vaishnava community, at least in, in South India, where I know it, is, is somewhat of a, a closed community, uh, caring for itself. It's a definite minority community in South India and doesn't have a great tradition of hospitals and schools and service and so on. But basically, this is a tradition you should be born into. And if you're in it, we care for one another. But the, the outreach there that you'd see in the Ignatia tradition is not there. But the other side of it would be that just as you have these differences in the Gospels, you know, that love of neighbor means going out and loving everyone, whereas in the Gospel of John you have this sense of a beloved community where the community cares for itself in a dark and strange world. You might say that what the Sri Vaishnavas are talking about really is more like John's Gospel, where the community needs to turn in and love one another in order to preserve itself before it can go out and do the other loving. So I think you could find some elements there. But what I really want to do um, is finally a very brief <coughs> part three of my presentation, and then I'll turn to my commentators. Where does this leave us? And I'd like to think that where this leaves us is that we praise and we're grateful for and being a Jesuit with the name Francis Xavier. I'm very proud of Jesuit tradition and think that this uh, charism of Ignatius to see, find God in all things is essential to the identity of the Society of Jesus in the 21st century to those who share Ignatian vision, Ignatian view of reality is important and we welcome it, we celebrate it, and we're all glad to be here. However, I think we can do better in the 21st century. As I said earlier, there's a danger of kind of a smugness or a condescension that you know, we are the proprietors, we're the owners, and we see God in you, that using this small example that I've put before you is that we also realize we're being seen. And that not only are we the subjects of vision, those with the wide perspective that it can see God everywhere, but that other religious traditions from other starting points with other energies and other stories <coughs> and other meditation practices have also learned in their own ways, your own ways, to see God in the world around us, to see God in other persons. And I think for me, this kind of sets up a very exciting dynamic where you start with a very positive development. You don't see the other as the enemy or the other as evil or the other as to be destroyed. You see that God, as you know God, is in the other. But then you realize that the other who's looking on you is not simply a passive subject of your looking, but that the other has the power to see you religiously see you spiritually, and you may look into yourself and say, I had no idea that Rama and Sita are within me. I had no idea that the presence of the Lord of the Sri Vaishnavas somehow radiates out of me. Say, it can't be. That's not my theology. How can that be? Um, it's a good experience to be kind of thrown off balance and say, just as I can see Christ in you, somehow God is being seen in me in a way that's unfamiliar to me where I came from. And that ability, again, a hundred times over. So from a Jewish perspective, different Muslim perspectives, Buddhist perspectives, Native American perspectives, and other traditions, the kind of multiple seeing going on on campus, I think enriches the situation that the Jesuit charism then is not to simply say it's the Jesuit way, but that the Jesuit way affirms the other ways of seeing as well, that we have a vision, we have the hope, the confidence, the hospitality, but then we welcome everyone of every tradition to speak from the heart of their tradition about what we look like as well. And I think this really moves to a, a new phase that 
Christ is everywhere on campus, in everything, in every person, in every opportunity. But that also, if one is a pious Sri Vaishnava who knows their own tradition, Rama, Sita, Vishnu, Lakshmi are everywhere on campus. And that Rama, Sita are in you, are in me. And you can say this Rama here, this Sita here, when you look around at the people around you. And again, Buddhist, Jewish, Muslim views that this would be a, a multiple seeing. And I think this really moves us to another level because in some ways what we need in today's world is not simply neutrality or secularity. And we don't need kind of the, the one religion that has the remedy to all the problems of the other religions. But rather we need to create spaces that are not secular spaces or private spaces, but communal spaces where we can see God in one another. And this vision of being able to find God in all things, but also realize that others you have welcomed to the campus see God in you and surprise you by the way they see God in you, open up possibilities we're not even dreaming of. And yet this is not an entirely unknown vision to say, you know, give up the franchise, open the doors, learn something new. Because I found this beautiful passage from Pope John Paul II when he went to India in 1986. He was speaking in Madras. And he simply said, why do we engage in interreligious dialogue? He says this, by dialogue we let God be present in our midst, for as we open ourselves to one another, we open ourselves to God. And I think there's something very simple and very profound about those words. We open ourselves to one another, we open ourselves to God. And I think in some ways I'm really enriching that point by what I've said to you tonight, by way of example, that the opening is, the, as Hopkins would say, you see Christ in every face. Um, you see that everybody somehow radiates the, the Vatican II spirit of the light of Christ. But that likewise, every religious tradition with its insight into the nature of reality is shining its light as well. And this ability that we would see God in new ways, we'd see God in ways we'd never see God if it was just up to us. But rather by the mutual seeing and seeing one another, we open the door. The last thing I'll say, and then I'll turn things over to my... Um, respondents, is that this is a, an enormous challenge to make this a reality on any campus. Um, it's not an easy thing to do. It's hard enough to keep a single religious vision alive on a campus in the 21st century. But the ability to say, we really want it to be an interreligious, intellectually alive, emotionally charged, spiritual environment in which all the religions flourish, and all the visions of how God is present are recognized by one another is kind of a strain. It can give you a headache if you think about it enough. But I think the point is to say that that's where the religion is going. It's not, we're not going to a merely pluralistic situation. We're not going to a merely secular situation. We're not going back to a single religion solution. But what we are heading into is a deeper and richer sense of seeing God in one another wherever we're coming from. And I think it's particularly appropriate at a Jesuit university with the Jesuit charism of seeing God in all things to say, we have this long tradition, we're simply liberating it now. We're opening the doors so that we welcome everybody's vision of what God looks like in all the faces on campus. And we will continue to learn from one another in the years to come as a spiritual reality, a campus ministry reality, a retreat reality, a classroom reality, a thesis reality, et cetera, et cetera. This vision is intellectual and spiritual, and it challenges us to be a truly, I would say, Catholic, inclusive university inspired by Ignatius, but then Ignatius, as I said, liberating everybody else's vision of reality as well. And with that, I will stop. Thank you. I particularly appreciate the way uh, that uh, Professor Clooney has um, breathed fresh life into this, to this beautiful Ignatian phrase that we hear a lot on campus, seeing God or finding God in all things. Like a skillful poet reawakening a metaphor whose evocative power has been dulled by frequent repetition and over-familiarity, I think Frank's reflections have allowed us to experience, certainly has allowed me to experience, that formula in its original power and depth. And the comparative or interreligious aspect of Frank's reflection plays an integral role in this task of rediscovery. 
reflecting on the Jesuit ideal of a sacramental vision of the world in light of the devotional text of the texts of the Sri Vaishnava tradition has offered a fresh perspective on the former. I'd like to focus on a theme that um, Frank touched upon, actually in my the original text I have, more or less implicit in the comparison Frank has presented, but then Frank spoke very eloquently about precisely this dimension, so um, I, I think I might just add to it a little bit. This is the integral role played by the imagination in fostering this sacramental vision of seeing God in all things. Prima facie, this, the, this positive role of the imagination jars with the rhetoric of receptivity that characterizes the spiritual or mystical writings in many traditions. The vision of God in all things, or in, in the non-theistic idiom of Buddhism, seeing reality as it is, results from clearing the mind of thoughts, images, and concepts. One thinks, for example, of the Zen Buddhist image of the mind as a mirror that must be cleansed of the dust of thought. Or Meister Eckhart's wonderful comparison of the spiritual preoccupations comparing them to the money changers whom Jesus chases out of the temple from the, from the gospel narrative. Only when Jesus is alone in the temple, the temple here serving as an allegory for the soul, will Jesus begin to speak. Now this rhetoric of cleansing the mind or heart to be open to God conveys a fundamental truth about the spiritual life, of course, in both Hindu devotionalism and in Catholic spirituality. And yet the Sri Vaishnava parallel suggests that paradoxically, the human imagination plays a positive, indeed indispensable role in fostering a vision of God in all things. The lovely episode from the Ramayana in which Sita's intense longing for Rama makes him palpably present reflects a long tradition of yogic devotional practices in India, practices in which the imagination is used to invoke the divine presence. Significantly, the Sanskrit word for the imagination in Sanskrit literary theory, bhavana, literally bringing into being, is the same word that is commonly translated as meditation in Buddhist texts. What links the two uses together is attention. The steady fixing of the mind on the visualized object, in this case Rama, makes him present. Appreciate the power of the disciplined use of the imagination in Hindu and Buddhist practice, practices of visualization we must bracket the enlightenment opposition between subject and object and the concomitant suspicion of the imagination as an impediment to a newly emergent scientific objectivity. The worlds called into being through the Indian imaginative praxis are, as the Indologist David, David Schulman argues, is, quote, more than real, in that the divine is more present in those worlds, sustained as they are by the unbroken attention of the devotee, than in everyday life. Rama, for example, is argu Rama is arguably more present to the captive Sita than he was to her in the flesh before her abduction. Now at this point, we, we can return to the Ignatian tradition, specifically to Hieronimo Nadal's teaching on visualization that Frank mentioned. This is one of the themes that Frank wasn't going to talk about, but he actually talked quite eloquently about it. Uh, as I understand it, meditation, meditation, I think, in, in sort of the tradition of Christian spirituality is, um, um, is, is contrasted with contemplation. It's a more, it's a discursive process. And in, in Nadal's case, um, it consists in imaginatively placing oneself in the gospel narrative standing beside the disciples with the risen Christ before the ascension, for example. Imaginatively entering into such a world is a technique for evoking certain Christian feelings, attitudes, and dispositions. Here, the imagination is used to institute a break with habitual patterns of experience in which the divine presence is eclipsed by more immediate concerns and everyday distractions. So I think that the parallel that Frank presents here to, uh, highlights, affirms, and valorizes the role of the imagination in Christian spiritual practice. It also highlights the way that attention sustains the experienced presence of the divine. Attention, the cultivation of which is so central in various Indic traditions of yoga and meditation, links the faculty of the imagination to the sacramental vision of God in all things. Thanks. Yeah.
really very much a pleasure to be here um, and to respond to Frank's paper, although I feel ill-equipped uh, to do so in some ways. Not only am I not a Jesuit, which I hope is obvious to all of you, but uh, I'm not Christian. I'm not either also a Hindu. I don't self-identify with either of those categories. I am a historian of religion in South Asia with a specialization in uh, the history and ethnography of Hindu traditions. Um, and so I will, of necessity, respond to Frank's paper from that perspective, and I will leave it to Shio um, to speak from a more explicitly Hindu perspective than he responded. First, a summary. Frank's line, line of argumentation, as I understand it, is that the Jesuits, part of being as old as I am, I the light is better over here than over there. Nope. It really isn't. So. Um, so I'm going to be doing this. That's why I sat here, by the way. Well, it's pretty lousy over there. Frank's line of argumentation, as I understand it, is that the Jesuit call to see God in all things should be extended to finding God in other religious traditions. This move includes being open to seeing, and I'm quoting here from the written uh, version of the paper, so I will try to be mindful of, um, of things that uh, were in the written version that were not in the spoken version tonight. Uh, this move includes being open to seeing how others see Christians and how other traditions also see God in all things from their own perspectives. To illustrate his meaning, he reflects on the ways that the Thiruvamuni presents its own version of seeing God in all things. Finally, he argues that this kind, the kind of mutual recognition he is advocating generates an important and largely new interreligious mo uh, movement. And this was uh, in the written version of the paper. It was implied in the spoken version an advanced course, so to speak, in which people from different traditions perspectives can together encounter each other face to face, subjects for one another. It also represents a challenge to any Jesuit university that wishes to cultivate a Christian and Catholic and interfaith sensibility, in as much as such can be cultivated by the intellectual work done on campus, in a way that does not merely privilege the Ignatian perspective. Fair summary? Mm. Fair summary. Okay. okay, thank you. Now as Frank so ably demonstrates, no one has ever owned exclusive rights to the seeing God in all things French franchise, to use Frank's word. Certainly, there are Jewish, Islamic, and other religious texts that all articulate a vision of God's omnipresence in ways that resonate to at least some extent with the Jesuit vision, as far as I understand it, albeit using different vocabulary and naming the experience in different religious terms. Even with respect to Hinduism, Frank could have drawn upon any one of a number of Hindu texts, including, for example, the Upanishads, which date the life of Jesus by around 500 to 800 uh, years, since experiencing the divine as a presence that permeates all of existence persists as a major Hindu theme across almost 3,000 years of scriptural history. Who's in my class? Kathy, you know all about the Upanishads because they're going to be on the test. You're not as many. Um, the Upanishads so articulate this vision of the divine power that's called Pranam described as all-being, all-knowing, infinite, beyond transformation, maybe, maybe not this, not that, in, uh, in via negative language. In many Hindu philosophical and devotional environments, Brahman is ultimately understood to be ultimately nirguna, beyond human knowledge, beyond material attributes, but Brahman assumes attributes and takes on form to become knowable to all individual beings. Hence, diverse experiences of seeing God in all things may be equally valid, as the divine may assume an infinite variety of forms. But I want to push further on this language for a moment and return to Frank's thoughts about the instances in which talk of seeing God in all things might serve to divide rather than unite, especially in the undergraduate classroom. Here what I want to do is pose a series of questions or thought, thoughts um, that are really standing with Frank and his paper, and I'm posing these questions really to Loyola and to us in the community. Here I'm thinking in particular about the non-religious, including the vast number of Americans who claim to be spiritual but not religious, as well as the large and growing number of nuns, that is N-O-N-E-S, <laughs> that is those who we would think of as religious but would not be as at home with God talk, um, those such as Theravada Buddhists, those who reject traditional historic religions such as spiritual feminists, and those who have plural religious identities such as Hindus or Bujus, for example, right? Hindu Jews, Buddhist Jews, um, or Buddhist Christian. How might one engage in this important and largely new interreligious moment if one does not have a theistic commitment and does not identify with a single traditional religion? 
I've heard it said many times on this campus that at a Jesuit university, it's the Catholic tradition that hosts the dialogue, so it's natural to use theistic language. And that argument certainly has a certain kind of legitimacy, namely one that's based in institutional identity. Yet Frank knows quite correctly, I think, that this kind of language, particularly, and Nelson here I'm quoting from the written paper, as an auspicious aspect of how we are as hosts and who they are as guests, might also be an intrusion. What implications are there, if any, for how we do business at Loyola University of Chicago if we take Frank's point about this issue seriously? Most important, I would say, is the question of how we go about engaging thoughtfully non-theistic and even atheistic perspectives and arguments. For doing so, I would argue, should be the work of all truth-seeking. Can such work be part of Frank's advanced course? Should it? These are questions to think about. Along these lines, I would argue further that for many reasons, we need to interrogate closely the often invoked, and yet I would, ultimate, uh, I would argue ultimately unhelpful opposition between religious and secular, with one being valorized over the other. First, these are such broad categories that ultimately they become useless. Second, let us not forget that secularism in Europe was a response to the horrors of the holy wars, such that it sought to establish common ethical norms based in reason, and hence has historically great value, I think, for all of us. Third, what counts as religion often has very secular interests, money, sex, or political power, for example, and what counts as secular is often quite religious intent, as in civil religion, for example. The list goes on. Frank notes that every understanding of the spiritual path and spiritual vision has or should have social and communal implications, and that the mutual vision of God, seeing and being seen, can change radically the context in which all the rest of our thinking takes place. It is explicitly stated in the written version and implicit in the spoken version. Here I see great promise, and I would welcome more reflection and conversation both from Frank and from us in the community about the social and communal results that Frank rightly suggests are worth pursuing. We all know about the stories of religious conflict and religious and inspired violence that have been taking place around the world for the last six months, but really forever. Um, and the enormous suffering that ensues. Talk of seeing God and the religious others should help support the work of moving beyond such conflict. But how exactly? Mohandas Gandhi affirmed that all religions are true to the extent that they manifest an understanding of the one transcendent God, which immediately implied to Gandhi the necessity of affirming that there is one human community. Hence, conflict must be managed in a disciplined way that acknowledges the full humanity of opponents. But Gandhi also claimed that religious texts should be evaluated first in the format on the basis of their ethical teachings. And he rejected any scripture or any religious teaching that he found to be morally repugnant. Well, what else? It doesn't fit his moral project. Is that the kind of moral goal that reading God and all things across religious texts affirms? Or is it something different? Questions to think about. Let me suggest also in this regard that interreligious textual study might hopefully be supplemented in the classroom with other kinds of interreligious in a course I teach called Encountering World's Religion, The World's Religions, for example, I choose three different religious traditions, and I take students to religious sites associated with those traditions, where they act as participant observers in a religious ritual, the Shabbat or mosque prayer service, a puja or Hindu festival celebration, or a church service, for example. I step back on these field trips, let our hosts take over, and welcome my student participant observers into their world. I found that such experiences, in which students see religious others seeing God in their own fashion to be transformative for many students who come to the table with little or no understanding of the religious other. So th could this kind of embodied activity be part of the project as well? And then finally, Frank speaks about the value of religious others, in this example of Hindus, seeing Christians, seeing God, both as, as subjects and as objects to each other. Yet a last history matters. When Hindus see Christians, or to offer another example, when Jews and Muslims see each other, often what they see is inseparable from recent histories of colonialism, oppression, conflict, abuse, or injustice. Histories that, sadly, often have been inspired by religion. The work of seeing God in all things, including the texts, <coughs> traditions, and practices of religious others, might also entail seeing clearly where our own religious texts, traditions, narratives, and practices have in fact done Satan's work instead of God's. And here, of course, I'm <laughs> the kind of interreligious understanding that Frank seeks seems to me to require such humility, a humility that comes with seeking and being open to finding that which we seek in unexpected places. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Shil Shukla. I'm a senior student here at Loyola. 
Uh, and it's really an honor and a privilege to be here tonight and to welcome Father Clooney to, to our campus. Uh, I was asked to speak on behalf of the Hindu students here and to share some of my, ex my experiences as a Hindu <coughs> on campus. Uh, I'm a Hindu student on campus and the president of our Hindu Students Organization, or HSO. To my knowledge, there are roughly 300 students on campus who identify as Hindus. And before coming to Loyola, I did not expect such a large Hindu population on campus. And I learned more about the Hindu community uh, at Loyola through my involvement with HSO. The Hindu Students Organization started 12 years ago here at Loyola with a small prayer space in the Mandalayan Center. We now have a growing community of Hindu students in our own worship space, the Puja Room, on the second floor of the Damon Student Center. HSO is a community of over 200 Hindus and non-Hindus that celebrates and spreads awareness of Hinduism through cultural and religious events, discussions, philanthropic activities, and daily arthi. Students of HSO gather in the Puja Room and regularly hold arthi prayer services and Saraswati Pujas. In addition to conducting the Arthi and Saraswati prayer rituals, HSO also hosts discussions and service events to further increase knowledge and awareness of Hindu practices and serve the community. As a community, HSO celebrates festivals and events throughout the school year, including Navratri Garba, Diwali dinner, Holy Celebration, and Hindu Awareness Week. Students of all faith traditions attend these events. This past year, our Garba celebration had over 750 attendees, and our Diwali dinner had over 250 attendees. With the guidance of Dr. Bala Chaudhary, Dr. Tracy Pinchman, and Brian Anderson, <coughs> the organization has maintained a strong presence on our campus. HSO has allowed me to pra actively practice my faith and learn about the faith traditions of my peers. Through interfaith events, such as our Hindu Shabbat dinner last year, I found that our campus is also a place for open discussion regarding different faith traditions. My experiences at Loyola have exposed me to the basic tenets of Ignatian spirituality, and I have found commonalities between Catholicism and Hinduism through the Jesuit values and traditions. At the end of his talk, Father Clooney talked a little bit about the notion of service um, with regard to Hinduism and Catholicism. Specifically, uh, I have found that the value of magis aligns closely with the Hindu ideal of seva, or selfless service. I would like to share the words of my spiritual guru, uh, or teacher, uh, Parampuja Pramukh Swami Maharaj. In the, joys of, in the joy of others lies our own. Loyola's emphasis on social justice is close to HSO and Hinduism and me as a Hindu student. Uh, as we participate in a multitude of uh, philanthropy activities, including tutoring and fundraising for charity. Similarly, the Jesuit value of Cura Personalis has also resonated with me. I could not have asked for a better experience as a Hindu student at Loyola, and I'm grateful to campus ministry, HSO, and the diverse student body here at Loyola for this experience. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Uh, my name is Zach Davis. I'm a senior here. I study philosophy and theology, and I'm a Catholic studies minor. And I just wanted to say thank you and welcome to Father Clooney and Father Bosco and the Hank Center. Um, when I came to Loyola my freshman year, I didn't really have any expectations as to what it meant to be at a Catholic university. I had been a student of the public school system my entire life. Uh, but whatever going to a Catholic school meant, I remember feeling excited. Uh, my first two years here, were spent situating myself in my own tradition. I frequented the mass, joined the Catholic Students Organization, and made a lot of Catholic friends with whom I could talk about our shared faith. I started studying the philosophy, theology, and literature grounded in the Catholic heritage, and I kept falling in love with this faith I had been exposed to. This is not to say that I made only Catholic friends. Living in Chicago, studying at Loyola, or in a university in general, these environments tend to prevent someone from stepping into a church and building a brick wall behind them. Still, I think that the experience that influenced my vision of pluralism the most was studying abroad. My junior year was spent uh, splitting time between Loyola's Rome Center and Beijing Center. Uh, both of them pushed me in their own ways. Rome, which was supposedly a place where I was surrounded by Catholicism, nonetheless challenged my perception of Catholicism. 
There's a scene Kafka creates in the trial where Joseph K. walks into a grand cathedral only to find it completely empty. Uh, Dr. Pinchman, you alluded to the sense that Americans are uh, identifying more as spiritual but not religious. And if I could sum up the Italians in a sense, it's that they are certainly religious but not spiritual. <laughs> <laughs> Moving to China, on the other hand, had a completely different effect on me. I'd spent my entire life trying to make friends by finding people who were like me, who had common interests in, uh, with me. And I can't really blame myself for this. Uh, that seems to be the standard advice we're all given growing up. Uh, even the more mature version of this doctrine tells people to look past differences as if they aren't there and look for unity in humanity and culture. Being dropped in the middle of a Chinese u university, I uh, opted to live with a Chinese student. Um, I didn't know him. I didn't know any of the language. Um, being a religious minority, uh, walking through Beijing and feeling this sense of loneliness and curiosity at the same time, it really started to change my perspective on how I sought out friends and my own interests. Commonalities became boring. I wanted to know what made me, the people I met, the places I visited, different. Relating this experience about back to what it means for me as a Catholic to study at a Jesuit university with a religiously pluralistic population, I think too often I used to worry about the assertion of someone else's beliefs was a direct threat to my own belief system. Now, I think that these threats are more healthy challenges, which prevents faith from becoming an ideology. Also, I think that an emphasis on unity, this constant searching for how are we alike, is actually contrary to the message of Christianity. The Good Samaritan does not try to negotiate or recognize the neighbor as someone who he can assimilate into his own identities. Rather, he shows him mercy because of, and not in spite of, their differences. We lose the truth of the gospel when we fail in mercy and love, not in knowledge. And living and studying in a religiously pluralistic environment does not jeopardize that. If I could conclude with a quote from Thomas Merton, who is a Trappist monk who uh, had a deep affinity for Zen Buddhism, uh, goes like this. Gandhi once asked, how can he, who thinks he possesses absolute truth, be fraternal? Let us be frank about it. The history of Christianity raises this question again and again. The problem, God has revealed himself to men in Christ, but he has revealed himself, first of all, as love. Absolute truth is then grasped as love, therefore not in such a way that it excludes love in certain limited situations. Only he who loves can be sure that he is still in contact with the truth which is in fact too absolute to be grasped by his mind. Hence, he who holds to the gospel truth is afraid that he may lose the truth by failure of love, not by a failure of knowledge. In, in that case, he is humble, and therefore he is wise. But knowledge expands a man like a balloon and gives him a precarious wholeness in which he thinks that he holds in himself all the dimensions of a truth, the totality of which is denied to others. It then becomes his duty he thinks, by virtue of his superior knowledge, to punish those who do not share his truth. How can he love others, he thinks, except by imposing on them the truth which they would otherwise insult and neglect? This is the temptation. Thank you. Hmm. Okay, so you want to just say some things in just response first, or did you want to just open it up to uh, questions uh, and comments from the, uh, from the audience? I could say something very briefly just to... Um, to highlight what the speakers um, had to say, thanking you all for your very interesting comments. And I think uh, part of the spirit of it with both um, you and Tracy in their comments that I was just skimming across the surface of so many important issues. So uh, thinking about the, the, the contemplative practices, the visualization practices, which would evoke a whole richer conversation across the religious boundaries is another door to go through and to realize that we haven't said enough about that topic, or, or Tracy both pointing to the, you know, the social implications and the implications for how we think about our institution, as well as not excluding the secular perspective, the nuns, the spiritual but not religious from the conversation, seems to be another whole layer of the conversation. Because I was really, the example is very intensely Catholic and very intensely Sri Vaishnava Hindu. It has a certain density to it, but the other conversations also, I think, can shed some light on who we are. 
and then um, Zach and Sheil, I mean, your presentations um, very you know, hopeful, I think, and, and encouraging because you, know, you are the future. And the idea that there are new insights and new ways of being interreligious that are arising at the campus here in Rome, in China, and the Hindu Student Organization and all these similar organizations are enriching with a certain intelligence and dedication how we think of ourselves as spiritual beings on the campus. So that's very helpful, hopeful for the future as well. So thank you all. I'll leave it at that because I know um, it's very interesting to hear questions and comments, but thank you all. Any scholars suggested, any scholars uh, suggested that we use the phrase glimpsing God in all things or even more nebulously sensing God in all things? Seems those terms, those phrases would be a little more, a bit more humble and more open to other traditions. Mm -hmm. I, I think that is a very basic insight that we need to listen to. I mean, even as I was speaking, you know, I'm shifting language. You know, seeing God in all things, seeking God in all things, finding God in all things. Even in the Jesuit tradition, as I read it, you sort of go back before, you know, between seeking language and seeing language. But I think the whole, um, you know, the medieval tradition of Christian spirituality about awakening all the spiritual senses. So there may be things you see, things you hear, things you taste, smell, and touch, but imperfectly. Um, I mean, there, there is a sense of, um, of finding that is recognized, but I think perhaps some sense of the, the imperfection of it, the glimpse, the partial gaze, would perhaps reflect the reality in which we are found. Perhaps there's a kind of idealization of it by saying you gain the full insight, whereas in fact we're always falling short and our meditations are distracted and so on. And that might alleviate and relieve us a lot of the pressure of, of promising too much or pretending to have claimed too much. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm from the outside world. I don't go to Loyola, I'm not a student. <laughs> okay. I'm just from the neighborhood. And, but I am a volunteer uh, cultural tour guide for the city of Chicago. And people coming in from all over the world come to the city to see what we have from a cultural perspective. And the most popular and most growing tour that I conduct is the one to see all the cultural and religious festivals. So people come to Chicago to see Bharata Yatra, the Chariot Festival. They come to see the various other festivals, uh, Katina, which is a Buddhist festival. And they're going on all over the city. So what you're talking about, or maybe alluding to, is seems to be having a worldwide interest. And it's exploding here in Chicago, and if Loyola wishes to step into this, the new street that you just guys got, or there would be a great venue in which to allow these places or these events to take place. Mm. Thank you, and I think, I mean, that too is in the spirit of the larger conversation, is that none of our campuses, no institution, is, is able to or needs to imagine doing this on its own, but that our entire world is changing. And to hear this about why people come to Chicago, what they're looking for, again, is very exciting and it opens up new possibilities. I think one of the things we can say, you know, why are there institutions of higher education uh, learning is to evoke the traditions to which we belong, as I was trying to do in my talk, and then to create kind of intense moments where we become conscious of the multi-levels. That, I mean, so much you learn by simply visiting, seeing, passing through, and going from site to site. But some way of kind of reading back in our traditions, you know, back to Rahner, back to Teilhard, back to Hopkins, back to Nadal, back to Ignatius, uh, back to the Numbilai and other commentators, back to Namalvar, Shadakopan. All of these things also kind of give us a depth that the luxury of having a campus and study on the campus doesn't do it on its own and doesn't replace what's going on more excitingly in the wider world, but kind of that kind of intense intelligence with spiritual eyes open reflects on a campus what's happening around us. And I'll, I'll leave aside the question of whether the, the new street should be used for this purpose. <laughs> that's, that's local politics. <laughs> So I have a question for you, Frank, or just a comment, perhaps. Um, last year, uh, Patrick Ryan came and talked about pilgrimage as a kind of a metaphor, a spiritual attitude that was shared within at least the monotheistic tradition. And as I heard you speak about 
about this kind of relationship between uh, seeking God in all things or seeing, finding God in all things, and a sense of a kind of a searching or a questing mm. to see where these commonalities. It seems to me that that metaphor, on its very the very nature of that metaphor, is that you, when you're going on a journey, you don't know what's you're seeing things newly, mm -hmm. uh, in a new way. Mm -hmm. You're perhaps seeing uh, the face of us, the other, uh, in a new way. You're having to negotiate it, not from usually a place of power or mastery, but as a place of, of companionship at, at best. Do you find that that metaphor is part of comparative theology, or is that also part of perhaps a way of thinking about um, uh, putting in relationship you know, Hindu uh, spirituality, it seems to me, and, and Christian spirituality? You mean specifically the image of the, of the pilgrimage. Pilgrim, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think in some ways, and this I think came out in um, our responses from you and Tracy in particular, that the that there's no kind of single moment to accomplish this, and the first question as well. We don't simply do it, we're done with it, and then move on. But it's an ongoing practice. It's a discipline. It's a spiritual exercise that takes a very long time to accomplish. So it's, it's, it's being on the path, on the way. I think this also, though, can spill over into the, very, the more specific practice of pilgrimage, and that the fact that there are both in our consciousness, our memory, our traditions, and that around us there are holy places. And that one can go to Rome or Jerusalem or holy places all over India and elsewhere. Um, the journey, the travel, the strangeness, the unfamiliarity of the language, the letting go and traveling with less, all can be part of the process. I mean, in another context, in India last winter, I gave a paper at a conference on pilgrimage in, um, in Pune in India. And I again appeal to the, the Sri Vaishnava tradition, again on the, on the Hindu side, about how is it that if God is everywhere, that certain places can be more intensely filled with the presence of God than others. And the example that was given in one of the commentators, again, was that, all right, we have groundwater, and, and somehow deep below the earth is this kind of uh, sense of the, this is before the groundwater was depleted, but nonetheless there was groundwater everywhere. But that on the surface, when people are thirsty, they need these intense pools of water that are accessible and deep and drinkable. And that there are the presence of God can be more intense and deeper in certain places. So both the ongoing practice, the temporal practice of going on pilgrimage in one's own tradition, going to the pilgrimage places of other traditions, but also the fact that simply there are certain conditions in holy places, possibly certain places on a campus that are more spiritual, that are worth going to, because the place itself kind of evokes. I mean, seriously, about the lake. I mean, how many of us find along a lake like this um, the opening to spiritual experience?